Hello, welcome to this Milwaukee PBS special, Speaking of Teachers in Crisis. I'm your host, Portia Young. This is National Teacher Appreciation Week, started nearly 40 years ago to honor those who dedicate their time, passion, and skills to educating our children. But now the teaching profession is in crisis. The Economic Policy Institute says the teacher shortage could reach 200,000 by 2025, up from 110,000 in 2018. This shortage is due to a number of factors. Among them are pay, working conditions, a lack of support and autonomy, the changing curriculum and societal issues. And of course, the pandemic has exacerbated the problem. We are dedicating this next hour to not only honoring our teachers, but examining some of those stress factors and the possible solutions to getting the profession back on track. We will hear from teachers about their days and the stress they face even beyond the COVID-19 pandemic. We will hear from administrators and the U.S. Secretary of Education about solutions. We will look at having more teachers of color in many of our classrooms, and we'll share some very special thank yous to teachers in our communities. Milwaukee PBS first began investigating the teacher shortage back in February on our monthly news magazine program, 1036. We shared an Ohio high school teacher's candid blog about her typical day that went viral. We've been receiving and sharing a huge response from teachers in our area, expressing similar experiences and frustrations. In case you missed it, here is Julie Ryan Holderbaum's blog, including all 113 questions she thinks about. By the way, she says that's about half the questions from her first draft. I am a high school English teacher. Um, this is my 26th year in the classroom. I'll be honest, I have thought about not teaching anymore. Leaving the profession is pretty daunting. I don't know what else I would do. The energy level that it takes to, to do the job effectively, I don't know how long I can maintain that. I had a day that I just had a hard time letting go of. And when I went home, I just kept thinking about all of the, the students that I had, the interactions I had, the decisions I made. And what I often do when I have a day that I have a hard time letting go of, whether it's because of teaching or any other stressor, um, I write. And I just kind of get it out on the page and that helps me kind of set it aside then so that I can move forward and not have it spinning around in my mind quite so much. Am I becoming the old cranky English teacher who nitpicks and loses sight of the big picture? Am I too tired for this job? Am I becoming too cynical? Are my standards too high? Haven't I lowered them since I began teaching all those years ago though? Should I have? Should I work through lunch or head to the workroom? Will I feel better if I have half an hour of adult conversation or if I get more of these papers graded? Do I need to make any hard copies for the handout next period? Do I remember to upload the video in the Google Doc to Google Classroom for the kids who are absent? Will I be accused of teaching divisive concepts if I lead a discussion about why we're not going to use the N-word out loud in class when we read of mice and men? Will the kids go home and tell their parents what we talked about? Do kids still do that? Do parents still ask? Is this book worth the battle it might lead to, or should I just teach Fahrenheit 451 instead? Wouldn't that be ironic? And isn't that exactly what those who scream about CRT being taught want? For teachers to fear the repercussions and give in to temptation to just teach safe material instead, so that the status quo will keep on keeping on and generations of kids will continue to grow up in the dark about so much of the ugly side of America's history? Is this worth the fight it might bring? Well, Obviously, it's worth a fight, but am I mentally and emotionally up for this battle, this year especially? More importantly, will my black students be uncomfortable if their white teacher leads this discussion in class? I know enough not to ask a black student to speak on behalf of an entire race, but would it be okay to privately ask a black student how they would feel about this discussion or that book? Should I grade these 45 quick 10-point responses first? or tackle the 25 longer essays. Go back and forth between the two. Am I fair to every student when I don't grade an assignment all at once? 
Do I grade the first essays harder or easier than the last ones? Why do I feel guilty when I take points off for not capitalizing I or proper pronouns? Why don't they click on the squiggly lines and fix their typos and spelling and grammar errors when the computer's literally marking them for them? Why are they still making these basic mistakes? We've gone over them so many times. Do they just not care about their grades? Do they even go back and read my comments and look at why they've lost points? Is this an academic issue or a motivation issue or a self-worth issue? Do we need to do more lessons on catching these mistakes or do I need to talk with them about the importance of the impression of themselves that they put out into the world? Is it unfair for a student to earn a C for a grade when the content of their work is probably at a B or even an A level, but their spelling and grammar mistakes are so ubiquitous and egregious that they lose points on every assignment? Is asking too much of them to click on the dang squiggly lines? Does that kid who just smiled at me and said, hey, Ms. H, have any idea how much I needed that friendly smile right now? Why is the office calling down that long list of kids? Are they getting quarantined and sent home? Wait, they don't have to stay home anymore, but they have to wear masks now, right? So will I get a list of kids who are supposed to be wearing masks for two weeks? How am I going to keep track of that? How many more times can I say, pull your mask up over your nose before I start inserting curse words into that sentence? Do I have time to run to the bathroom between classes, risk someone being in the single stall teacher bathroom or go to the student bathroom further away? Is that crying in the next stall? Hey, are you all right? Do you need to talk? Which class do you have right now? Can I walk you down to the guidance office? Will my class of freshmen be okay if I get there a little late? Can we settle down and get started, please? Where's your Chromebook? Why isn't it charged? Where's your charger? Why haven't you borrowed one from the library then? Is that yelling in the hallway? What's going on? Did one of you just call the other a bitch? Why are the kids behaving like this this year? Is it COVID related or just the stress of COVID plus all the other division and dissension in society that we're all contending with? Is Michael acting off today? Is he tired or just depressed? Should I pull him out in the hall and ask him if he's okay or would it be worse to draw attention to him? Should I call home? Have his grades been slipping? Did you do the assignment that was due for me today? Does Becky have her cell phone in her lap? Why isn't it in the slot with the others? Is it worth calling her out on it? Right now or later, privately? In either way, do I want to resetting setting her off when she's been doing so well and we seem to be forging a tentative relationship? Is it a big deal if she isn't actually using it? Or has she been using it and I just haven't seen it happen? Why isn't the Chromecast working? Why would it work last period and not this period? Is the internet down? Why are we either freezing or frying? Wouldn't it be nice to be able to regulate the heat in our own rooms? Is this email for real? Are they kidding with this? Another meeting? Another book study? This year of all years? Don't we have enough to do? Can't they just give us more time to plan or collaborate with each other on the actual work that needs done? Am I getting sick or am I just exhausted? Is my throat sore from talking so much today or because I'm coming down with something? Will they be able to find a sub if I stay home tomorrow? What am I teaching tomorrow? Is it something I can adapt easily for a sub or will I need to come up with something new? How much will that impact my plans for the rest of the week? Why can't I be more of a type B teacher? Isn't it just easier to suck it up and go to school with a cold? But what if it's COVID? Is that an email from a parent? Do I have the energy to deal with that tonight? Why are they emailing me so late? Where is that info about that poetry contest? When was the deadline? How did I not know until now what a great writer Jane is? Oh no, Michael didn't do the assignment. Is it too late to call home tonight or should I wait and call from school tomorrow? Do his parents work during the day? Do they support his use of he, him pronouns? Do I need to refer to him as Michelle when I talk to them? Why am I watching the news? Oh my God, another one? How many school shootings does that make this year? Is the legislature seriously going to try to pass that? Do they have any clue how that will impact teaching and learning? Why do the people with the power to address some of the problems always seem to arrive at solutions without asking educators for feedback? Don't they realize that only leads to more issues? Are all teachers as overwhelmed and exhausted as I am? Does anyone care what teachers are going through in this country? When is someone going to do something about it?
Julie isn't the only teacher going through this. Milwaukee PBS producer Scotty Lee Myers asked three diverse Milwaukee public school teachers to submit video diaries following spring break. We hear in their own words what their school days are like, the good, the bad, and everything in between. My name is Angela Harris. I am a first grade teacher at Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Elementary School, the African American Immersion School, and this is my sixth year teaching. I think that particularly this year, it's really important for teachers to be documenting their experiences in the classroom. I think that we have seen a slight you know, decline in the respect for the teaching profession. Um, and I think that it's important for folks to get a, a firsthand experience of what's actually happening in our classroom spaces. My name is Lucas Weir. I'm a culturally responsive teacher leader in the district. Uh, and I teach here at uh, Barack Obama School of Career and Technical Education. And this is my 14th year as a teacher. I was really excited when I had the opportunity to participate in the Video Diary Project and obviously a little nervous as well, but I feel like over the course of the last six years working at Obama and even working at North Division prior, I think a lot of people don't understand what our jobs are like. Name's Raven Chappelle, teach at Allenfield and I've been teaching fifth grade for three years now. I decided to join you all on this video diary journey just because even in my own family like I feel like there are so many people that don't really recognize and realize like how just how much teachers do beyond like teaching. It is the first Monday after our spring break vacation. Uh, numbers were kind of low today. What is frustrating and taxing is the interruption and the distraction that these standardized tests are, they're impacting our schools in a, in a bad way. That is not the only way that young people can showcase their intelligence by clicking on a screen, a multiple choice question. That's it's not effective and it's hurting our students more than anything. So do you want the good news or the bad news first? Um, so the good news is today that I was able to work really closely with uh, a handful of students, um, especially some of those that uh, had missed class and needed to make up some work. The bad news is that I saw 15 students today across three blocks. Um, so our school is on block scheduling. We have four blocks in a day. Um, I have 64 students across those three blocks, and I saw 15. In the Milwaukee Public Schools, we have about 30 high schools. Uh, not all of them are created equal. Uh, we have what is called select criteria enrollment in the district. So when you have those criteria, you're going to have five to seven schools like we do in MPS that have between 90 uh, and 96, 97 percent attendance. And then you're also going to have schools like uh, mine that really struggle uh, with attendance. Yeah, it was a pretty typical day. Had a few criers. <laughs> We're also learning fractions. We're getting it. Um, just not as quickly as we need to move. Like our pacing, it moves so quickly and I... You know, I, I struggle with leaving students behind. You know, if I'm being honest, my scholars are really struggling with music class. They have no problem when they are in front of me, but when they are with other leaders in the building, they seem to really struggle. So today I'm really looking forward to uh, going home and doing very little tonight. Um, I think one of the things we hear a lot about is that the job of a teacher doesn't end uh, with the last bell of the day. For example, if we have, you know, 20 to 25 school days or weekdays in a month, my guess is that I'm working into the evening between like 10 and 15 of those. It was an exciting day today, yesterday 
we had our mock election and the, the scholars voted for Cavalier Johnson, our first black mayor ever, um, which is so important, particularly because I teach at uh, an African-American immersion school, but also because Cavalier Johnson comes from the same community that a lot of them presently live in. For the first time in 14 years, I applied and just recently had a second interview for a non-teaching position, although still an MPS. I've kind of sensed for the last couple years that those in decision-making positions feel that as long as we have a handful of quality public options uh, to go along with the private, the choice, the charters, uh, to accommodate our, our middle-class families, that as long as those people are taken care of, that it's okay to have dropout factories like Obama's. I'm actually feeling a little bit more energized than yesterday. Math went a little bit better today too. There are some students that um, have come up to me today actually and were like, look, I still don't get this, I need extra help. So I'm gonna have to find some time somehow <laughs> tomorrow or Friday to spend a little extra time with those that need a little bit more explanation. Oh. <sighs> So a lot of MPS high schools uh, have students come in and the doors are actually right behind me. Um, and then they check their bags through an x-ray scanner to see if they have any contraband, uh, to see if they have cell phones. Not all MPS high schools do a scan and not all MPS high schools uh, collect phones. Uh, and what we would actually see is that uh, schools and MPS, high schools and MPS that serve more white students, uh, that serve more middle class students, are the schools that don't have scans. Had a pretty good day overall, but it was, I don't know, this day was, um, it was just a little bit tough for me. Uh, just dealing with a lot of anxiety today. Um, and yeah, I was thinking last night about how there's not a whole lot of not a whole lot of like space for teachers to deal with their own mental health issues. Uh, today was a, a decent day. I had two buses. Two buses were canceled today because there weren't any drivers. If I had to think about roses, buds, and thorns for today, mm, roses are. Jeez, oh, sorry, the phone rang. Um, and that's another thing. Like parent complaints about student behavior, and. I don't know. I'm just trying to do everything in my power to like make build a restorative community amongst my scholars and the parents aren't aware of what that is. And like if someone does something to their child, they're just like that child should be suspended and kicked out of the classroom. And I'm like, it's just not that simple. We got brand new smart boards. The teachers in our building don't get excited by a lot of stuff, um, but this was, there was like a, a buzz uh, with the classrooms around me. And I think it's because we've gotten so used to not having nice things. Uh, Fridays are always exciting in my class because it is Freedom Friday. Um, we choose a freedom fighter or an influential black person to talk about, to learn about on Friday. It was a low number in terms of attendance. We had two buses that didn't come. I had attended the Bucks game on Thursday night. It was a really exciting game. The Bucks won. Um, and so I was definitely tired when I get to school and I'm always um, hyper aware of how I'm feeling because I know how I'm feeling can manifest in different ways in the classroom. And so the person that who covers my lunch and covers the scholars outdoor recess has pretty much been out all school all week. And so I haven't I didn't have an opportunity to have lunch um, at all this week. The day went by pretty well. And one reason it went so smoothly was because I had another teacher helping me out in here. Um, new teachers are only given a mentor for their first year. As if after one year of teaching with a mentor, you got it all figured out. I'm really grateful that, you know, we had this opportunity to do some reflecting and 
that we had an opportunity to um, share with the general public what it's like to be a teacher. If you know a teacher, definitely show them some love during Teacher Appreciation Week, because um, we need it now more than ever. A National Education Association survey found 55% of educators plan to leave the profession sooner than planned, mostly because of the pandemic. Producer Mariano Avila shares the conversation with his wife Kate about her decision to resign after 15 years and her uncertainty about returning to the classroom. My name is Kate Avila. I was a teacher for 15 years, but for the past two years, I've been homeschooling my own kids. For me, leading up to the pandemic, Teaching was getting harder and harder. I had had a second kid, and I felt like my life was getting tighter and tighter, um, working all day and carrying the stress home, but then also bringing a, a folder full of things to grade on the weekends and planning for the week ahead. So school had become me waking up at 4.30 in the morning to make all my plans and make meaningful lessons for my students, get grading updated teaching, which, you know, sometimes after teaching, you have quite a lot to um, get over just because students, you know, can be kind of difficult sometimes. Um, and then I was coming home and I was giving the leftovers to my family and that just wasn't enough. It was like my own children were on the back burner. Well, I made it through that first spring and I felt like I, I really gave all that I could, but my school was a private school, and so they decided to go in person in the fall right away. And I was definitely more on the nervous side with COVID because I have a history of asthma. And so when I realized that my school was not only taking all this part of me as far as like what I was giving to the classroom, um, you know, then I was kind of asked to like also put my own health at risk, and it felt like too much. Um, not to mention all of the things that they had in place, like teaching school in person and virtually on Zoom at the same time, fielding questions from kids through your computer and making sure that everyone was seeing you, um, having everything recorded in the classroom. It seemed like it would have been risky, but also a lot more work. Um, teaching was something that I was going to do forever until I retired. I thought, this is what I'm good at. I love this. I find meaning in this. I'm making an impact on my community. But what I realized was that it was having a negative impact on my family, and it was, it was too hard for me. And I think teaching is it's a really heavy profession, and it seems like it's just getting harder for people to keep it up. I think sometimes teaching is, if you look at everything a teacher does, it's a job for more than one person. And when we ask one person to do all the things that a teacher is expected to do, it's, it's too much. And there's a lot of talk about teacher burnout and it's a real thing. Parochial schools here at home are concerned about holding on to teachers and attracting new ones. I recently talked with the retiring superintendent of Catholic schools for the Milwaukee Archdiocese about the toll the pandemic has taken on teachers and what the future may hold. The overall challenge that teachers and principals have felt over the past two years has been uh, characterized by uncertainty. Right now, I would say teachers are very tired. Um, they're they're looking back at their last several um, months, several years, and I think actually asking where their successes were. They, in some cases, saw a slide off in student learning because of the fluctuation of learning instructional modes. And they need, they need the boost of not only normalcy of, of schedule, but being able to plan with a more secure future. What do you tell the teachers who may be burned out, as you say, or just aren't so sure about the path forward anymore? I think it's very important, and this is something that we tried to do, to reaffirm the dignity of this profession, that the, the act of teaching is the act of changing a life. And it's important to go back to that central mission. 
really, and, and I've had teachers say to me, and I know my colleagues have as well, we needed to be reminded of that, that in the midst of, of this, this swirling turbulence of the past two years, this uncertainty, we were in this for a reason, and these children and these families needed us. In fact, I think families probably have never needed schools more because we were their we were their partner in that uncertainty and we came right into their homes through virtual learning. Another crisis that we're facing amongst all teachers, parochial and public, is the shortage of teachers. Yes. How is the Archdiocese trying to address that or can you address that? It is a huge concern and uh, on, one, on one level we're looking at ways to perhaps attract people from different walks of life into teaching, perhaps, um, um, ex and we are exploring, and perhaps getting validation for alternative forms of certification of teachers. Now that's it's still a very preliminary stage, but for example, retired professionals who might think about teaching as the beautiful and dignified profession that it really is, you know, as a chance to pay back in some ways. Uh, we've had very great success with retired people moving into our schools as teachers. So that's one way we're trying to address uh, the, the shortage. We're also engaging in more focused partnerships with our Catholic colleges and universities and with other colleges and universities to um, perhaps examine uh, intern programs in, uh, for our schools. So those are a few examples. And how does the Archdiocese compete with public school systems on salary front? Because sometimes that's, that seems to put Catholic schools or parochial schools at a disadvantage. It's a huge disadvantage. But we do find that the people in our schools almost universally are there because they want to be there. They see this as a calling. They see it in our language as a vocation. As, as a way of life. And I've, I've been in this a long time, uh, over 50 years, and I've always believed and tried to impart to the people I've been able to influence that once a teacher, always a teacher. One doesn't leave it at the door at 3.30 or 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock. It's a summer vacation uh, uh, way of life. It's a, it's a Christmas vacation way of life in that we're always thinking about the children under our care. And that's a, that's a dignity that all teachers uh, can aspire to and really own as they, as, they th as they think about this as a way of changing the world. To minority teachers. Mm -hmm. um, and you may think that you are not making an impact on this life, but you definitely made an impact whether if you believe it or not. You are the face that they needed, even if you don't think so. Research shows that our teacher shortage is especially concerning when it comes to black and Latino teachers, especially males, who are already few in number in our classrooms. Producer Everett Marshburn spoke with an NPS teacher who entered the classroom as a second career because he wanted to make a difference. We know overall there's a teacher shortage. Uh, nationally, uh, schools are hurting, um, specifically with teachers of color. Um, and when we talk about males in the profession, um, it's even more uh, a greater need. Milwaukee Public Schools has a majority minority pupil population. Black students alone make up half of the enrollment. And out of the 4,400 teachers this year, less than 20% are African American. And black male teachers are just under 5%. But that's twice the national average. Currently in Milwaukee Public Schools, because we're an urban school district, we, we actually look good on paper, but we're not where we want to be because we know that we serve a population of students that um, need folks that reflect who they are. Devon Prayer was a professional basketball player and a coach who changed career paths. He's currently finishing his fifth year as a teacher. At Riverside High, he teaches special education, assists in science, and coaches the basketball team. He says he's found his calling. 
there was a sense of duty that I wasn't getting in the arena that I was in before. Um, and I felt like I, I had more to give, more to offer. And I'd always been immersed in basketball and I was always connected to youth in that manner. So it just kind of seemed natural for me to go that way. I mean, teaching isn't just teaching. There's more to give for a student, especially in an urban setting, um, than just teaching them one plus one is two, or how to spell, how to read, how to write. There is a whole bunch that goes into emotional development, um, social development. There's a lot of things that go on behind the scenes that, especially in an urban setting, African-American males are very important for. Uh, having a person that looks like you that you know, understands where you come from, understands what you're going through, that can talk you through that process, that can help you take the next step. It's very important. Um, and that's, it, there's just a lot more to give. What do you think we need to do to encourage more black males to come into teaching? Make it easier. I mean, it's very difficult to get into this. Now, what I do understand after going through the process is that there are a lot of steps, a lot of processes that you need to learn, a lot of curriculum information, a lot of um, how to teach, um, but there's got to be a way that we can encourage more black males to come into, into teaching, into education, especially in an urban setting. One of the places Harris is looking for more black teachers is at historically black colleges and universities. We know that we have a lot of employees that have gone to many HBCUs, and so what we've done in the Office of Human Resources is tapped into those employees that are currently with us and ask them, like, let's go and visit your HBCU. Let's reconnect and see if we can pull some of those students who are looking for opportunities to come to Milwaukee. And so we've been to multiple schools this year, just really trying to do more outreach to those HBCUs to ensure that these folks understand that, look, you, someone from your community was in your shoes once, right? And now they're here and they've been with us for 20 plus years. So we've been uh, to uh, Arkansas Pine Bluff, Tennessee State, Alcorn, uh, Jackson State. So we are really trying to make sure that we're tapping into our local resources, which is our human capital. Our employees come from very various places, tapping into that so that we can go out and outreach with those communities. Producer Patricia Gomez looks at the challenges Latino teachers face. Well, I have been involved with educational matters for the past 50 years. Um, I have been involved with the, the uh, establishment of bilingual education, bilingual programs, but I don't want to be just thought of. I have been involved in pedagogy in general. The shortage of teachers corresponds to working condition. It's free. The pandemic, this is not new. The pandemic just brought forth a lot of what we knew. Teachers are not appreciated in this society. The salaries are not high enough. Uh, there are some benefits that come with it, but it's still not enough. Top of with the fact that more teachers are feeling the pain of what's going on and they're leaving the profession. Now, all of that affects bilingual education. Latinos in this country are very diverse. The refugee population is very diverse. In some districts, there are more than 300 different language groups. The other reason we have a problem in many of our schools is that there is an incompatibility between the people that teach and the populations that are growing in those schools. The other way for the future is getting kids that are in high school now uh, to become involved, engaged in the idea that they can become good teachers. But why would kids want to be good teachers when they're seeing their teachers struggling? What I enjoy most about teaching is being able to empower individuals and give them the option uh, to, to be able to explore. Let's take a closer look at who wants to become a teacher these days. U.S. teacher prep programs have reported shrinking enrollment numbers over the past decade, citing factors such as low pay, school violence, lack of teacher respect, and of course now the pandemic. According to the Wisconsin Education Association Council, the number of students studying teaching is down 35 percent nationally, with some Wisconsin programs seeing even steeper enrollment declines. Producer Marianne Lazarski talked with four student teachers who are about to graduate from Mount Mary University. 
My academic hustle revolves around my hustle growing up on the south side of Milwaukee and not having a lot of people that grew up with a college diploma or like seeing them try to make ends meet. I have a high school history teacher that I would like to appreciate. She's actually the only person in my life who ever told me that I'm going to be a teacher before I even thought to be a teacher. And I told her, absolutely not. And look <laughs> at me now. I'm pursuing a graduate degree in orientation and mobility, which I would be working with blind children. And I grew that passion because my father's blind and like probably 80, 90% of my family friends are as well. The reason why I want to be a teacher is because growing up with this disability made it hard for me to think that I could be successful one day. Ahora clase, vamos a hacer una práctica verbal, a verbal practice. I am a student teacher in West Dallas for high school students and I teach Spanish. I believe my philosophy of teaching centers around the idea of what I needed when I was younger. I needed like a direct face that I could look up to, um, a teacher that wore their hoop earrings or wore things that looked like Latino culture. Empathy is the biggest thing that is being lacked in terms of teaching um, from outside. What scares a lot of people or like Teaching in general, we get a lot of false connotations or like negative comments. Like sometimes they'll be like, oh, I would never do that. I would never teach. Or I, why are you doing that? I feel so bad for you. You know? Um, so you get a lot of like comments like that. And I think it derives from fear of being spoken to um, by someone younger in a, in a poor way or the pay or just fear of like, not being appreciated the way that you're supposed to be. I'm a first grade student teacher in New Berlin. I have a real passion for working with kids. Um, I love to watch them learn and help them learn new things and watch them grow over the school year. Despite grade level, there's things that teachers experience in their jobs that it's just not comparable to any other field, really. Um, just realizing how much we are really with these kids all day, like eight hours a day, typically. Um, like we're like the biggest influencers on like their lives for the most part. I'm a student teacher in New Berlin and I teach third grade. I kind of think it's scary. You know, it's like, oh, what am I getting myself into? Because like you hear all these things, you read about it online. And now that we're student teaching, you, we kind of experience the, all the stuff that is on the teacher's plate but not even to the, their extent. So it definitely is nerve wracking of, you know, what am I getting myself into? But then you have experiences with the kid where they'll write you a nice note or they'll come up to you and give you a big hug and it's like, wow, like, this is why I'm doing it. I'm a student teacher in Milwaukee and I teach second grade. I was working with like two year olds, one year olds, babies, you know, so it's like, they always came, came for me like for comfort, for anything, like any little thing that come for me. So it's like, I already, like I was like, already like kind of like comfortable with that already. So like going into like teaching, I'm like, okay, like I think I got this. Like, all right, I'll sit down, listen to you. Like what's going on, you know what I mean? Cause same thing for like the two year old, like they wanted a hug. They wanted to sit in my lap and just talk or just play around, you know what I mean? So it's like, I feel like I'm pretty good. Like just like, okay. I got it. <laughs> Even though it's hard and overwhelming because it's like there's 33 that want the same thing. You know what I mean? So like that's the hard part of it, but it's just like making sure that at least you like have a little bit of time for each of your students. If there's some solutions to this, you're going to see a dramatic impact on students wanting to become teachers. Because like we all mention in different ways, People love and honor the education system and honor educators, but they fear the lack of pay. They fear um, the treatment. They, they fear the, um, the less liberty that they're going to get. And I think that that scares them off, and they end up settling for jobs that don't follow um, the direction their heart wants to take them, which is why they also end up in positions where they're like, I'm in this business office job, in this cubicle, and nothing is speaking to my heart, nothing is speaking to my drive as a person. Lowering your class size, helping the support, um, having time within the day just for lesson planning because not only when people look at teachers they think, oh well they have the whole summer off. The whole summer is spent lesson planning and then our days once we get out of school is grading papers, adjusting our lessons to what our class actually looks like. 
all this stuff where our job isn't uh, it, the work, the balance between a social life and work life, like there's no balance. We go to school to get in debt and then, but we do it because we want to be a teacher and not because we know our, our occupation is going to pay off that debt. So make it affordable for teachers to go to, you know, to achieve that degree and not throw out their whole financial life. I've heard several times about a lot of these problems before even pursuing a teaching career and there's still no, like no change and I'm about to graduate college, you know what I'm saying? Like this has been a thing for a very long time and yeah, whoever we're speaking to, they're not hearing us. I hope the support of teachers, it completely flips and I hope it becomes something positive and we actually do make move for change because like when you think about it, the, the future of our country is in our hands. And so if we don't have enough teachers to really, you know, build the future politicians and the people who are gonna be continuing to help this country sustain itself, like it's only gonna hurt all of us. Those students also wanted to thank their professors at Mount Mary for all the guidance and support they received. Those two words, thank you, are the words teachers probably don't hear enough. With that in mind, producer Scotty Lee Meyer surprised a group of former and current MPS teachers with heartfelt messages from their former students who say they've been forever changed by what they learned in their classrooms. Rolling. So we're actually here for a different reason. And I was wondering if you wouldn't mind taking a seat for us. I'm gonna play something. Thank you for trusting us on that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna play something on the TV here for you. Should start right about now. <clears throat> My name is Brad Schleikowski and I'm here to honor Mrs. Kelly Clark Page. My middle school homeroom teacher and science teacher at Walker Middle School. Dear Mrs. Kelly Clark Page, middle school is a tough time for most kids and I was no different. Back then coming out as gay was something that wasn't really talked about. And when you learned about the bullying that was happening to me in school and on the bus, you stepped up and took me under your wing. You stood up for me when I had no one in my corner and that's something I've never forgotten after all this time. With all my love, Brad. This means the world to me. And this, this is, well, I never knew I had that much of an impact, but that's why um, I do what I do. Um, for this. Oh boy. Oh, Sam. <laughs> Holy cow. <laughs> My name is Sam Guyton. I was Mr. Roberts' student at Milwaukee High School of the Arts, and he was my vocal coach. Vocal coach, mentor, everything. Dear Mr. Roberts, I wrote you a letter. If you know Mr. Roberts, simply by saying his name often is followed with a smile. All the young teenagers that have been touched by his teachings are destined for success, and I'm just another student that has been granted that opportunity. The coolest part is that he's still in the classroom and will continue to shape the future of the Milwaukee music community for years to come. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. You guys are sneaky. <laughs> wow. This is something that fuels me to keep doing what I do. It was really gratifying to, to hear. I got a little video for you to watch. Hi, my name is DeAndre Lewis and I'm a former student from Riverside University High School. I'm here today to honor my teacher, Mr. Wild. He was our AP psychology teacher. Dear Mr. Wild, your mentorship during high school means the world to me. And even when it was tough, you never gave up on me. I appreciate you, I celebrate you, and thank you once again. That is beautiful. It's a million dollars. It's why I live. 
everybody should have a, a purpose for living. And I fell into teaching and I, I couldn't ask for a better job in my entire life. It's why I exist, to help lift up the young people. My name is Adam Carr, and I'm honoring Mark Horowitz, who is my fourth grade teacher at Goldemeyer. Dear Mr. Horowitz, it takes a village to raise a child. And Mr. Horowitz, you were a leader in that village for so many children. As an adult, I built a career seeking and telling the story of Milwaukee. On my best days, I feel like I'm back in your class with my friends, embracing the magic in the world around us and each other. You put so much of your heart and soul into our classroom and we felt it. Thank you, Mr. Horowitz. <laughs> it's, it's a wonderful thing. Mark just, just loved teaching. He loved teaching and he loved showing those kids the world, the world in the city, the world outside the city. And he believed they could do more than most people think nine and 10 year olds can do. I have a video here for you, just for you. Okay. My name is Sam Ragani. I went to Ronald Wilson Reagan High School, and I spent four years there with the educator, Mr. Chad, who taught us art history. Dear Mr. Chad, while I have spent the last five years of my life as a professional creative, I do want to take this moment to sincerely thank you. I thank you for your sacrifices, most of which I don't fully understand. I thank you for your knowledge, for without it, I wouldn't be half the artist that I am today. Thank you for helping change my life. So that was our surprise for you today. <laughs> you can edit that out, right? <laughs> <laughs> that is the, the food that keeps you going. That is, why you show up. That little surprise right there was really nice. I appreciate that. I would actually like to sit down with a legislator. I, I'd like to invite them all in to schools and follow a teacher um, throughout the course of a day because I think they have a huge impact right now. Educators want their voices heard and want those who can make a difference to take action now. Producer Mariano Avila asked the U.S. Secretary of Education what he plans to do about our teachers in crisis. It doesn't take a pandemic for us to realize how important teachers are, yet today we still have places that are not valuing them. Uh, educators or paying them a salary where they have to have two to three jobs to make ends meet. You know, it's unacceptable for, for educators who in many cases they have a master's degree to have to work another job so they can think about sending their children to college. We can do better as a country. What is your department doing? What are the initiatives that are in your pipeline to, to make sure that teachers stay in their jobs and new teachers come on board? The three things that I think are needed. The first is competitive salary. The second are working conditions that are conducive to professional and personal growth. Our teachers are, are often asked to do more and more. But what we're doing at the department, in addition to the, the bully pulpit, is really putting funds where we know uh, we need to support uh, efforts uh, across the country. An example of that is last week we announced $65 million in the SEED program. And the intention there is to diversify the profession, to make sure that you know, our teaching ranks uh, represent the beautiful diversity of our students. So we're putting money there towards programs there. We're lifting up best practices. I visited Tennessee recently and I saw high schools that have pipeline programs for their students to become teachers. What can people at the local levels do that, you know, the federal government is, is not doing or not capable of doing? You know, to put it in context, the federal government pays for about 10% of education across the country. But think about it, 90% of it uh, typically comes from state and local uh, government. So we're, with the 10%, we're really pushing to make sure that we're elevating the profession. We really need to see that same level of urgency and action at the state and local level. 
state level, really be intentional about working with colleges and districts to increase the pipeline. Make sure your high schools have a teacher track. What are you hearing after two years of, of this very complicated teaching environment? You know, when our schools thrive, our communities thrive. And uh, I've been fortunate to travel to 30 states already to see that in action. And um, what the teachers are saying is they're tired, but you know teachers, they roll up their sleeves. They wanna be there for their students. It's about time we're there for them as well. The good news is there has been some improvement on the local level. Just last month, the MPS school board agreed to give teachers and other staff a 4.7% raise. Many other districts approved the same pay increase, including West Dallas, West Milwaukee, Kenosha, Oshkosh, Green Bay, and Eau Claire. While Atosa schools approved a 3% raise for teachers every year until they reach about $95,000. Seeing students, you know, um, they sort of get that light bulb moment when they're learning things and they're picking up and they're getting excited about it and, and that's just a lot of fun. It just it, you know, it keeps you going, you know. It has been said that teaching is the one profession that creates all other professions. During this Teacher Appreciation Week, producer Emmy Fink takes us to Genesee Depot in Waukesha County, where a very special school is extremely proud of three very special teachers with a combined 96 years of teaching experience. What's the difference? Sometimes you get tornado watches and tornado warnings. Teaching is one of those jobs that you really learn on the job. You keep growing and I feel now I have a lot of tools in my back pocket that I can access. My name is Mr. Sewer. I've been teaching 36 years and 25 years here at McGee. How's your day? I have the greatest job here at McGee. I'm a regular ed para educator and I um, get to be everywhere in the school. I work with 4k through fifth grade. Hi I'm Mrs. Pendy and I've been teaching for about 24 years, and this is my fourth year at McGee. And then you have six more. Everything you do, everything you say, just as long as they feel safe and they're happy and they want to be here, they'll be here, they'll be ready to learn. That's, that's my big takeaway. Hi, I'm Mrs. Koss. I teach first grade at McGee. Bing, 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 you got it, got it, girl. Now you gotta trace it. I think McGee's just been my rock. It's the one safe place I've come to. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I always felt welcome here, loved, feel safe. We do a lot of things to keep everyone safe, the kids, teachers, staff, everybody. How many corners? What? Well, first graders are extremely impulsive, <laughs> but they love everything about everything we do. They love learning and that's pretty much my goal is just to get them to love coming to school, love learning. They're ready uh, to learn, you know, they're, they're little sponges. Um, they really want to take things in and they want to be entertained while learning. I love the variety of my job and um, every day is different so it's just fun. He loves us like we were his kids. She is kind because she makes teaching fun. That unexplainable kindness that she shows. The reason that you're sitting here is because there was some amazing essays written about you. What does that do for your soul? <laughs> yeah, I, I cried when I read these. They're amazing. It made me realize everything you say to everyone matters. Hi, my name's Leo and I'm in fifth grade. I wanted to write my essay about her because I think she deserves recognition because she's an awesome teacher. What makes her an awesome teacher? She's kind, hardworking, and she's smart. She always gives people multiple chances and doesn't give up on them. Their words, I mean, it's just so... It's very powerful, very powerful. I feel like totally honored and extremely humbled by just so many of them had so much to say. You can always rely on Mrs. Koss that she's going to build extremely strong relationships with her kids and it carries through with everyone. She's in the hallway smiling and hugging every single child that she's had. She definitely commits herself to getting to know the kids and building that strong relationship. Hi, my name's Charlie and I'm in fourth grade. 
I wrote about Mr. Seward because he actually has helped me a lot through the school year because when I was having a hard time on math, I normally don't do easy, but ever since he started helping, it got really easy. It's special, it really is. And when you read these, um, it, it's really uh, heartwarming and uplifting. Mr. Seward is so reliable with getting the kids outside utilizing our amazing campus. And he's just one of the most caring men you'll ever meet. He, he really wants to be able to help the kids in his classroom and solve every problem. If you're struggling really hard and he can tell because he'll come over to you and help you. As I was walking around the room as they were writing these essays, because fourth and fifth grade wrote them, I was checking. Okay, that's not me, that's not me. And I was thinking, <laughs> oh, maybe I won't make it onto the air, you know, or something like that. But I was surprised at the number of kids that did write, uh, write them. Hi, my name's Alyssa, and I'm in fifth grade. Ever since I came here in third grade, she's always been so welcoming and just completely just made me feel at home right away. And she always has this, like, unconditional love for everyone, and that's why I chose to write about her. It just really warms my heart, and um, I just like getting to know the kids. Um, through the classroom and out at recess, and they just um, are fun to get to know. She wants to have fun and kids see that, and she will dress up as a leprechaun, she will dress up as Corella DeVille, and she will play the role to make sure that kids are having fun. When someone is having a rough day, her pendy sense kicks in. Once my friend and I were having a bad day and she came and talked to us, and just like that, all better. Penny sense is kind of like, she just knows, kind of like spider sense um, that they use in the Spider-Man movies. And it's just like, you know that someone's having a bad day and you just automatically just know how to make it better. Just a smile, a laugh, a joke, sharing a story. That's what helps kids get through their day, starting it off on a good note. And if anybody wants to be a teacher, you need to love kids. Love every part of them. You know, you're gonna have some that our challenge, but you know, I think they're almost my favorites because I see the growth and the difference at the end of the year. It's so nice that even during some of the toughest times in education that everyone still comes with such a positive mindset. Happy Teacher Appreciation Day, Miss Pendy. Thank you, Mrs. Cause, for everything you've done. Thank you, Mr. Seward, for helping everybody in our class and school. Thank you, not only to the, the staff here at McGee and those who have been interviewed, but to anyone that's in education. You are making a huge impact, and please keep remembering that you are here for a reason, and it's why you love doing what you do. So thank you for everything that you do. We want to thank all our educators who shared their experiences and thoughts with us this past hour. Milwaukee PBS will continue focusing on education in all of our local programming. For more, find us at milwaukeepbs.org and on our YouTube channel. Thank you so much for watching. Speaking of Teachers in Crisis. Mm -hmm.